Good afternoon. Um, welcome to the um, IBC and Commerce Bank keynote speaker series. I'll turn it over to Dr. Pablo Arenas, the president of Texas A&M International University, to um, welcome you to the to the um, keynote address and to the Western Hemisphere Trade Conference. Welcome, everybody, and, and good evening or, or good late afternoon. Um, Buenos tardes, uh, bienvenidos a uh, Texas A&M International University. Um, the IBC or the, the Western Hemispheric Trade Conference is probably uh, certainly our most successful event on campus. It has been our most successful on campus event for um, well, almost all of its 25 years. Uh, and I've been here for 14 of those 25 years. So I, I've been able to see a lot of things. Um, this uh, conference has had a history of uh, exciting speakers um, and relevant topics. And I think the relevant, certainly this year, as I look through the program, there's a lot of things that are very relevant to what's going on in terms of trade on the border, cross-border trade. You know, um, I, I haven't spent a whole lot of time driving up uh, and down I-35, but the one time, couple of times I have, I've just been amazed. I mean, there's no stoppage of trucks. In fact, I think the truck traffic has gotten heavier than it was before. Um, and this year, I said, is no different than, than previous years. I think it, the re relevant topics to what uh, is going on in this region uh, and and also between the U.S. and Mexico, uh, and so it's really it's really timely uh, what uh, we have here for the uh, for this 25th uh, anniversary uh, of the Whisper Henry Trade Trade Conference, which coincides, of course, when, with a year later, uh, but uh, with the uh, 25th anniversary of uh, our founding as a as an institution, at least our movement of the institution here. Um, I want to thank IBC. And Commerce Bank, they've been a tremendous partners, uh, particularly for the uh, the IBC Commerce Bank Speaker Series, uh, which is this is also part of that speaker series. At least this evening's talk, um, and so I'm really, really happy. I'm very excited uh, to be able to welcome all of you. And uh, I know this is virtual this year, so it's going to be a little bit different. Uh, but I hope next year to see you all on campus. Uh, you can uh, be able to be come here and and uh, hang out with watch the deer. Uh, and the uh, and the javelina and all the other critters we have on campus, a very soothing environment, uh, along with uh, with students we hope will be on campus. Um, I'm very, very excited to have our uh, seminar, our speaker here uh, this evening, um, Ambassador uh, Earl Anthony Wayne. Uh, I'm really looking forward to listening to his talk. Uh, we, we probably more than any other community in the uh, Along the U.S.-Mexico border, uh, really feel the the impact of the relationship between U.S. and Mexico. So I really, do, it is really is important that we get things right. And so with that, I will turn it back to George and let him introduce uh, Ambassador uh, Wayne. Thank you very much, Dr. Arenas. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the fourth and final event um, in our IBC and Commerce keynote speaker series for 2020 and 2021 and the opening address for our 25th annual um, Western Hemispheric Trade Conference. I'm George Clark. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Western Hemispheric Trade in TAMIU's A.R. Sanchez School of Business. Our center, with support from IBC Bank and Commerce Bank, brings speakers to Laredo virtually this year due to the COVID-19 academic to talk about a variety of different topics in the areas of international trade, international economics, finance, and demography. Before introducing today's speaker, I also want to thank our sponsors for supporting this event, IBC and Commerce Bank. With their support, um, we've been able to bring many, many thought-provoking speakers to TAMIU and Laredo, either in person in the past or this year virtually. Um, for the audience, there'll be a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. If you could submit your questions through the Q&A, um, or the chat feature on the app, then um, I will I, I will try to ask the speaker as many as I as I can. Today's speaker is Ambassador Anthony Wayne. Anthony Wayne is a distinguished diplomat in residence at Tex at American University and is a public policy fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. He served a long time in public service, and during this time, he served as the ambassador to Argentina, the deputy U.S. ambassador in Afghanistan, and relevant for this talk, the U.S. Ambassador to Mexico. 
He's also been the Assistant Secretary of State for Economic and Business Affairs. Ambassador Wayne's presentation is entitled The Importance of Getting U.S.-Mexico Relations Right. With a new president and Congress in place in D.C. and the potential for a new chapter in the relationship between our neighboring countries, this is a particularly opportune time to think about this issue. So we'd like to thank you, um, Ambassador Wayne, for visiting TAMIU and Laredo virtually. Um, so thank you, Ambassador Wayne. Thank you very much, George. It's a great pleasure to be with you all and to have this opportunity to uh, share some thoughts with you and hear some Q's and A's. So let me try and share my screen. Okay, I'm going to say a few things that I know most of you know a lot about, since uh, where you live determines that this is really important to you. But uh, I always like to tell audiences in the United States that the, the key thing about the U.S.-Mexico relationship is that it touches the daily lives of more U.S. citizens than any relationship that the United States has in the world. And of course, that's true even to a greater extent for Mexico. Um, as you all know, there, there are many Mexican-Americans. You can see the number here. We have a big border that you live on. Um, and we've had different phases in this relationship, as many of you know from having grown up and, and worked on the border for a long time. Uh, we had a, a very interesting period of trying to build closer relationships. And then we had, a for the last few years, a, a, re a relationship that was troubled on some fronts and yet moved ahead on others, including the negotiation of the new U.S.-Mexico-Canada uh, trade agreement, which is now uh, going into effect and being implemented. Um, but we have uh, a number of challenges, as you know, to address across the border. You can see these laid out here, and we're going to talk about them as we go forward through the uh, this conversation. So just to start off, something, again, that many of you know is just how important Mexico is to the United States in the economic arena, our second largest export market, our second largest ag export market, um, the first or second market for 28 U.S. states, and of course, the number one for all the border states of the South. And interestingly, for the first time in, in uh, modern history, the United, uh, Mexico was the largest trading partner of the United States in 2019. Uh, it became uh, number two again in 2020. And that both of that had a little bit a bit to do with the sanctions on China uh, during 2019. But again, interestingly, in the first two months of 2021, Mexico is back there at number one as the largest trading partner of the United States. And of course, for Mexico, the United States is the source that that takes 80 percent of its exports. So that's a lot. And you can see here, this is a big relationship. I always like to think of it as a million dollars a minute on average crosses that border and uh, that's that's a good way to think of how important it is um before the pandemic again as many of you know that was also a million border crossings a day that's way down but hopefully we're going to get back there soon and maybe even more um interestingly the the relationship in trade between Mexico and the United States has grown six times since NAFTA went into effect in the early 1990s. Um, that's a lot. And a few years ago, everybody used to talk about, oh, there are these emerging countries that are really important, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. Well, we sell more to, uh, to Mexico than we do to all those countries together. So for us in the United States, Mexico is really important. Uh, here you can see the, what the 2020 uh, trade statistics look like. You see China a little bit ahead and then Mexico and Canada right behind. There are two neighbors as our most important trading partners, especially combined. And this is a really important slide because what it really is telling you is how much we make things together with our two neighbors. This, it's a study now that's a little bit old, 2010, but I think uh, some more recent studies have validated this, at least for the vehicle market, 
So about 40% of the value of a finished manufactured product coming into the United States from Mexico is actually U.S. product, U.S. value. So I always like to use the example of a Honda CRV, so a Japanese car, but put together in Jalisco. If if that gets to the border, let's say it looks like it's worth thirty five thousand dollars. Well, really, forty percent of that thirty five thousand dollars is value that was added in the United States or Canada. It's it's just underscores that we really make things together. Um, with our two neighbors, and you can see the two neighbors have are way above any other country in the world for the percentage of finished manufactured products that that come from the U.S. when it comes back into the uh, United States after being put together or assembled or finished in Mexico in in that other country. Also, this trade uh, supports about five million U.S. jobs. And the interesting thing here was. When the uh, Clinton administration was trying to sell uh, NAFTA as really important, their argument was, well, this is really important because this trade supports 700,000 U.S. jobs. Well, you can now see it's uh, seven times that number of jobs now that are supported by our trade with Mexico. Uh, this just shows you, you can get a, a little view of the, the top states trading with Mexico. And of course, no surprise for the border state, but if you look up here in the in the upper Midwest, what you see is a cluster of states that are involved in manufacturing and particularly vehicle manufacturing. And that's uh, a very integrated set of industries. Again, no surprise to you all, but just a nice reminder, if we took all the border states and put them together, they'd be the third largest economy in the world. So there's a lot of activity going on in these in these border states between the United States and Mexico. Uh, the other point to remember is that it's very important for Mexico the amount of money that's sent home by Mexican Americans and Mexicans in the United States. It was a, a record last year of forty billion dollars. It's expected that that number is going to continue to rise this year, and that's about ninety five percent of the remittances that Mexico gets come from the United States. So let's look at the border where you all live. <laughs> uh, you see your, you see yourselves out there on the border. And these are the formal border uh, control points. There are a lot of them along along this border. And, and as you know, there are big spaces in between. But of course, all of the licit trade and a lot of the illicit trade actually go take place through these um, controlled border crossings, not in the ungoverned space in between. And pre-pandemic, just a reminder for all of you who used to go back and forth on a regular basis, uh, this, whoa, okay, let's see if we can get that back again. Uh, uh, there's a lot of money in tourism back and forth between the two countries. 55 million visitors, was the average for the uh, for 2019, and they spent about 41 billion dollars on one side or the other of the border. And this is just to show you what you know, since you live in one of the largest crossings for trucks, but you can see that steady rise in the number of trucks crossing the border, um, especially since uh, 2009, the low point during the last uh, recession that we had. And again, we'll talk about this several times, but this is looking at apprehensions at the border. And it's just a reminder that the situation from the early 2000s and the 1990s uh, changed dramatically uh, over, over the, the next two decades. Um, but we have seen these surges in the last several years. And of course, we're living through one right now, and we can talk about that. Um, during this period of time of managing the border, the, the 2012 through 16 period one was really one where both sides, the officials accepted this idea that there are really serious problems, but we share the responsibility for finding solutions. And they actually worked very hard to try to find solutions to make it easier for people and goods to get across the border, to communicate more effectively between 
uh, officials on both sides of the border, and they even started developing uh, customs posts that would be jointly manned by Mexicans and uh, U.S. citizens. They also were working on that illicit traffic across the border. Um, during the the last few years, the Trump years, the focus on making that legitimate border management uh, flow well uh, really was replaced by the focus on on migrants at the border and, and lowering those numbers. And so as we'll get to talk about a little bit later, of course, when President Biden came in, he wanted to change that focus, um, but he got the unpleasant surprise of a new surge from Central America, which we're still grappling with, and I suspect we're going to be grappling with for a while. So again, something probably that many of you already know, but the high point for um, Mexicans in an irregular status in the United States was 2007. And between 2007 and last year, um, or let's say 2019, uh, that the number in the United States uh, pretty consistently dropped or was pretty close to net zero. Number of Mexicans going back to Mexico, vice those coming to the United States. There's always been a flow still of people trying to head northward without documentation, um, but it has been it has been matched up until the last year or so by Mexicans coming back uh, to their home country. As we'll talk about, those numbers of apprehensions of Mexicans at the border started rising last year and are continuing to rise this year, and there are probably a number of reasons for that mainly uh, surrounded about the economy and jobs and other things, but we can talk about that. So this is just to give you a view of the uh, total number of people undocumented, unauthorized in the United States. And you can see that high point for um, Mexicans in the United States in an undocumented status was in 2007. This only goes through 2017, but you can see it declined and then the black line are um, other immigrants coming into the United States. And interestingly, in these years also, the, the main source of people staying in the United States were people who came in not across the border, but came in in other points of entry and overstayed their visas. So the, the recent surge in Central Americans uh, is, is not, uh, We've seen this before when I was in Mexico in 2014 and 2013, 2014, 2015, we saw a large surge in families coming and children coming. Um, the United States, Mexico and others worked together to deal with that, both enhancing enforcement and providing assistance and aid to Central America. Um, when uh, President Trump came to uh, to office, his focus was much more on tightening uh, the border controls. That led to rising tensions with that time the government of Peña Nieto, President Peña Nieto. Um, and then when uh, AMLO, Andres Manuel López Obrador came to power, he proposed the idea of, well, let's go after the root causes of this and together let's see if we can create more investment and more jobs. And though the United States agreed to that in principle, they did not really uh, put much effort into that. Rather, the focus was really on tightening controls at the border and uh, enlisting the, the government of Mexico and the governments of the Northern Triangle countries in Central America uh, to just slow people from coming and stop them from coming. And that led to the that uh, way you guys know very well the way to Mexico policy and other policies. So President Biden came saying, I'm going to reverse some of those policies and let's see if we can have a more humane way of dealing with this. And uh, his arrival coincided with uh, many people heading up from Central America. Clearly, there was a lot of pent up demand for people wanting to, uh, to head northward, leaving the conditions that they find very uh, unpleasant in their home countries. And you can see in this blue line on here, 
the sharp uptick in the number of um, people arriving at the border and trying to cross into the United States and being apprehended. So the, uh, the sort of orange line is 2019, which was the previous uh, high point uh, under Mr. Trump. The red line down at the very bottom was 2020 during the pandemic when things really did drop off with a combination of the pandemic and tighter enforcement. Um, so right now we're in this really challenging period where if these numbers kept going up, they would certainly set a uh, something that looks like a record. Um, and this is another way of looking at it. You can see the, uh, the numbers shoot up here, especially in March of the apprehensions by at, at the border by CBP. And that one, who knows where that one is. Okay, this one is one that sort of shows single adults is the reddish color. And then you get families, the light blue, and unaccompanied children, the dark blue. So you can see the breakdown of people. So single adults are still by far the largest numbers coming to the border. Um, and then here's, a, this is just looking at the unaccompanied minors. So you can see this, as we've been reading in the news, uh, this number is way up <clears throat> and it is causing problems because the Biden administration has said, no, we're going to treat these people more humanely, but they really don't have the, the facilities right now, uh, and they're scrambling to uh, get control of the situation. Um, as you know, during the pandemic, the people have also been sent back by the health, using the health justification of the border. And this is just to show you those, those numbers being sent back. It's been about uh, over 60,000 a month for since October through January. So now let's look a little bit at crime. So there are two big things I think to pay attention to on crime and why uh, the importance of cooperating between the two governments on crime. This is looking at the United States and it is looking at the overdose statistics and deaths by overdose. I had suspected that when the 2020 numbers come out, we will have set a new record in the United States for overdose deaths during the last year. Um, but what you can see from this chart is that that light blue line, that, that is the highest line until 2015, that is overdoses from prescription opioids in the United States. So these are opioids that people got a hold of in one way or another um, that were legally available in the United States. And what happened was in about 2010, the uh, cartels in Mexico said, hey, there's a big market there in the United States. Look at all these people taking opioids. Let's Let's try and meet that market demand. And as I always say, these may be uh, unscrupulous people, but they are not all dumb people. So they, they started producing heroin in greater quantities in Mexico, growing uh, opium there, sending it to the United States. And that's that green line that you see going up uh, to the right hand of this. And then finally, the yellow line, which shoots way up are the synthetic opioids. And so what happened was that these became, were increasingly available coming from China and the cartels in Mexico said, hey, this stuff is really inexpensive. It can be shipped in very small amounts and get a lot of money. Let's start sending that to the United States. And they did. And, and it, it also came in directly through the US mail and some of it came through Canada and other ways, but the biggest source was through Mexico. So then on the Mexican side, the real press, the real thing of pressing for better cooperation has to do with security inside Mexico. And this just shows, this chart shows the number of people um, saying that security is the most important issue in Mexico. And so, and then it, about 73% of Mexicans say they don't feel safe in their own cities. Um, 
And here's another way of looking at this. These are the number yearly homicide totals in Mexico. And so as you can see, 2018, 2019, 2020 really set records for the number of homicides. And though there was a small drop between 19 and 20, essentially it's no difference because you're only talking about 100 and a little over 100 different deaths. So uh, this is a, a very serious problem in Mexico and uh, which is fueled by drug smuggling, but it's fueled by other kinds of crime also. And in general, uh, by a high degree of impunity. Uh, this is another way of looking at the homicides over the past uh, three years. It's, it's estimated that this violence in Mexico costs about 20% of GDP. That's a big cost. Um, and it's also estimated that in the United States, the Mexican drug cartels make about uh, 19 to $30 billion a year selling those drugs. And they use a lot of that uh, to buy arms, um, to fuel corruption, as well as to pay for their activities. So this is a look at, this is a very good study if you're ever interested. It comes out every year, it's called the Peace Index. And what this gives you an idea of is the, um, both the economic impact of violence and where violence is is really getting worse. And the dark red are the uh, are the places with uh, that are least uh, peaceful. And you can see, interestingly, this includes Baja California, Chihuahua, and Quintana Roo, and that's where Cancun is. Um, and this does shift around in over various years. It will move between different uh, parts of Mexico. So this is, I just put this in this week. It's just the State Department issued its uh, report on human rights that comes out every year. And so these are a couple of the things that they highlighted about Mexico. Uh, an estimate of 94% of crimes, either unreported or not investigated. Uh, organized crime, uh, the vast majority of that crime, you know, without any consequence for it. And then the very, very sad point about journalists, where uh, there is, you know, almost 99% here estimated by this very respectable NGO, Article uh, 19, uh, had no consequences when the journalists were killed. And most of them were killed for reporting on organized crime. So the U.S. and Mexico started cooperating in 2007 to try to be um, more effective in supporting each other, I think. And previously, there was cooperation between the DEA and their Mexican equivalents. But what this new plan called Merida did was to try to also provide U.S. assistance in, in equipment, in technical training and capacity building for Mexico. And as you can see here, it wasn't just aimed at going after organized crime. It was also aimed at uh, improving uh, respect for rule of law and human rights to having a 21st century border and not a 19th century border, which many people believed that we had and some will say we still have. And then also to helping communities that were faced with a lot of criminal violence um, and the United States has has appropriated about a little over three billion dollars during this period of time for this. Mexico's certainly spent ten times as much in their effort uh, going forward. And we have, as you can see here, that well, I won't spend a lot of time unless you want to come back to it. But we have different ways in which we talk about this, and we've cooperated over the years to try to make this a better. Uh, set of bilateral cooperation. Um, just to go quickly, recent years, in 2017, there was an agreement on a comprehensive strategy to go after this. Um, when AMLO was elected, he ordered a review of the Merida program and cooperation, uh, but the government of Mexico never agreed to an update to uh, organize and, and agree on an updated strategy. So this cooperation has continued, uh, but really has not been updated. And um, during the period of time, 
uh, U.S. agencies uh, became more frustrated with the uh, the cooperation they were having. There was a crisis. So you may remember in December 2019, there was a, 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 a couple of families traveling together, women and children that were all killed uh, as they were driving up toward Arizona. Um, that led to a U.S. threat to designate all the uh, cartels as foreign terrorist organizations. Um, Mexico responded to that, increasing some cooperation on extraditions and other things. But during the subsequent year, the number of opioids and meth and other things actually seized at the border has con continued to go up. And then uh, late last year, or in the second half of last year, the former defense secretary of Mexico was arrested in the United States. That sparked a bilateral crisis. The United States agreed to send him back to Mexico. The Mexicans decided not to press charges against him and released him, and rather they passed a new law that sharply restricted anti-crime cooperation in Mexico. And this is just to note, I won't go through this in detail unless somebody wants to ask about it, that there have been a number of suggestions out there for a while of how the U.S. and Mexico could reinvent and improve their cooperation. There's a general agreement that there's a big space for improvement here. Um, there's also general agreement that there are really serious problems, and that includes uh, corruption in law enforcement and the justice system, um, that impunity that you heard about, the poor prosecution rates, human rights violations, a lot of weapons trafficking from the United States into Mexico that has not been uh, effectively controlled estimates, re, re, about 70% of arms captured by um, law enforcement in Mexico came from the United States. And then a lot of that illicit money, somehow those billions of dollars make it back uh, to the cartels. So I'm going to talk here a little very quickly again about trade and the USMCA agreement. So you can again see this is really big, $1.3 trillion a year of trade. Over 12 million U.S. jobs are supported by this. And about half of all the trade is in some, it's in intermediate goods, which again goes back to that point that we build a lot of things together. Intermediate goods means those aren't finished products. There is something that goes to the other country to be turned into a finished product. So there's a lot that we trade between the three countries as part of a production process. And you might remember earlier I said U.S.-Mexico trade grew six times during NAF the NAFTA period, and, and overall trade uh, between the three countries grew four times during that period. Um, there's a lot of foreign direct investment. I'm not going to go through this, but you can just see that all three countries are investing in each other. And very interestingly, the largest uh, by far the largest per capita investor is Canada investing in the United States. This is an estimate of how much each country gained by the existence, the fact that uh, NAFTA existed each year. And as you can see from this, the estimate was that Mexico gained the most, $170 billion a year, the U.S. next, $127 billion, and then Canada about uh, 50 billion a year. Now, Canada has a much smaller population, um, but still, that just shows this is an estimate. If we didn't have NAFTA, what would we be missing? So we're, we're missing a lot that we have if we didn't have NAFTA or now if we didn't have USMCA. Again, this is just looking, this is going to show you those are the states' biggest trading partners between the US and Mexico. Here are the biggest trading partners between the U.S. and Canada. Now I'm going to go back again. Look at this. See where these guys are? Look at that. It's not that. It's not that different. They're, uh, California, Texas, and the Upper Midwest are important for both of our neighbors, and that's again because we make things together. And then what this points out is about five million jobs supported by trade with Mexico, seven million supported by trade with Canada. So we, neg we negotiated, the three countries negotiated, they signed a, a new trade agreement um, in January of 2020. It went into force of, in July 2020. 
and then implementation has been slowed down since by the pandemic. Um, there were some big changes in this, especially related to the vehicle sector. I won't go through them all unless you want to hear, ask about them later if you want to. Uh, but this is one of the big challenges for implementing. This is what's going to happen in the truck and auto sector as it's implemented. There's some changes in how you settle disputes, which is going to be important. And then really important is the new treaty is modernized. So now all that trade that takes place across the internet, all the data that flows, all the services there are reflected in this. And labor rights and the environment are both in this new agreement. It also allows uh, 16 years at least of existence. So certainty for businesses is really important in here. And that's really the biggest gain from this this treaty that's evident to everybody is reducing the uncertainty. And there are going to be things that, that we have to work on here. There's a lot of attention from U.S. unions and Democrats on if me on Mexico's uh, labor reform and if it's going to really allow more democratic practices in the labor sector. And then U.S. companies are increasingly concerned with what Mexico is trying to do in the energy area. And then, of course, big challenge coming back from COVID-19, reopening the borders and dealing with what we learned about our supply chains, which is basically we didn't really understand our supply chains very much. And when they got disrupted, they they really uh, they got disrupted. And so we need to look at how to make them resilient as we go forward. So this is the a slide that just shows you that USMCA is actually pretty popular in the United States. I think during all the debate in recent years, people came to see and understand that, gee, trade with our two neighbors is pretty important. So elections. So uh, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador was elected in July 2018. He got 53% of the vote, more than his two, his second, third uh, competitors. He remains very popular. Um, He's still about 60% popularity overall in the country. He's a very good communicator. We can talk about that. And we're coming up on president on uh, congressional elections in Mexico again. And his party, which is called Morena, is up there at 38%. And the next, right below them at 33 is, I don't know who I'm going to vote for. And then down below are the opposition parties. So you can see they're pretty well positioned to come out well in these uh, elections that are coming up. And there, as you can see on this slide, there are over 20,000 different seats. Oh, I went too far. 20, 20, 21,000 different seats up for election in all sorts of different places. Uh, the biggest focus, big focus is going to be on the governors that are up, 15 of them of the 32. and the uh, federal Congress. And if AMLO can get two thirds of the deputies for his coalition, he can uh, change the constitution, which is one of his goals. So this is just another look at uh, the different states where the elections are taking place. And it shows you the current breakdown of the Congress where uh, Morena has a majority, but not a two thirds majority. So what did AMLO promise to do? Uh, he promised to give more attention to reducing inequality, to help the poorer members of society, to build some key infrastructure. Um, he promised to achieve 4% average growth of GDP over his next six year term. And as you are gonna see, that will be very hard to do. He, and he promised to develop the South of the country. He also made pretty clear that he wanted to strengthen the role of the national energy companies, Pemex, the national oil company, and CFE, which is the National Electricity Authority. And he is uh, going, he's working to do that and meeting a lot of opposition along the way. He also said he was going to focus on reducing poverty by increasing the minimum wage, by having jobs programs for young people, helping farmers, helping the elderly 
said he was going to uh, attack corruption. One of his big themes was that the previous governments had been very corrupt and he was going to change that. He did say he was going to pursue the USMCA agreement and he was going to expand educational opportunities. He also said that he was going to uh, really reform the way they went after uh, uh, criminality and dealing with uh, um, criminal groups. Uh, and you can see a number of different things he promised here. The one thing that has significantly changed is he did away with the federal police, a civilian police force, and replaced it with a National Guard, which is under the military and mostly staffed with former members of the military. So we'll miss this after a year. We'll go beyond after that. Let's look at after two years. Uh, still very popular, um, but a lot of challenges out there from the pandemic, from the economy, um, from still high crime rates, uh, not really demonstrated uh, a lot of effectiveness against corruption. In fact, one of the reports from his National Statistics Agency said that corruption actually went up during the first year of AMLO. Uh, he also has gone after a number of independent regulators and institutions and tried to bring them uh, under the, the control of the presidential administration. So the criticisms, there are a lot of criticisms right now, uh, is that he has tried to put much more power around the role of the president, that by focusing on austerity, uh, he actually helped uh, or did not help deal with the pandemic. Uh, and there was an 8.5% uh, shrinking of the economy last year. Um, a lot of people are very are critical of his investment in Pemex, that national oil authority. It has uh, record losses. It has the highest debt of any national oil company in the world. Um, people question how much they've actually succeeded in dealing with corruption. As we mentioned, public security, the violence levels remain very high. Um, and there are, is a regular sort of set of people who are just who are warning about taking a, away a lot of the checks and balances associated with democracy. Now, he still remains uh, very popular, 60% popularity. Uh, he uh, argues that they're making good progress on corruption. Um, he recently gave a speech, as you can see here, saying we're going to grow 5% this year and we're on our way back from the recession. Um, it may be, uh, but this same period of time was also one of the deadliest for the, uh, the pandemic. So there are a lot of questions still out there. Now, let me just quickly mention, um, I'm going to go through this. Basically, before the pandemic, the economy had already shrunk in 2019, and the people were urging a number of reforms to help deal with that. Uh, over the last year, the GDP dropped 8.5%. Worth, worst performance since 1932. Um, the, there was a significant drop in both domestic and foreign investment. Um, there's a report that just came out within the last two weeks criticizing the government for mishandling the uh, COVID epidemic and saying 190,000 lives could have been saved if it had been better handled. Uh, Mexico's credit ratings uh, are uh, are being questioned, especially Pemex. The poverty rate went from 37 to uh, over 40% uh, during this last year. The offset to that was those record remittances from the United States and exports to the United States, which remain strong. For this year ahead, the, the growth estimates are between 3 and 5%. That still wouldn't get them back to the 2019 level, but it would be a, a good support for the economy. And I won't talk. I won't talk about this. I will just mention in the in the energy area, um, uh, AMLO has moved ahead with trying to strengthen the uh, National uh, Electricity Authority and Pemex control over the electricity sector and the fuel sector. This has met a lot of opposition. Uh, from the, the companies that have invested about $26 billion 
in trying to develop renewable energy sources and to build pipelines and uh, to make other investments in this sector, which they believe are now in danger. Uh, the courts have so far frozen these efforts. They froze the electricity law. There's a new law that has been passed in the fuel uh, fuel area, and that will probably also be frozen if it if, by courts because uh, these laws do violate the Constitution as it's now written to embody that energy reform. So migration, really quickly, I already mentioned, I'll just go through this. So just a sign of the, the crisis that we now face. In March, there were 19,000 unaccompanied children that were taken into, into custody in the United States. And most recently, uh, the United States has asked Mexico and Central American governments to help. Mexico's reportedly promised 10,000 troops on the borders, and the Hondurans have apparently promised 7,000 police and Guatemala 1,500 troops to help slow down the northward flow of these individuals. Um, again, this is just looking at this, you've already seen it, but just to show you again, you can see 2019 was big, and now people are worried that we could pass 2019 this year. And then this is a reminder that all the changes aren't on the border or in Mexico or Central America. This shows the backlog in the US immigration courts. And we really need reforms to our immigration system. We need, uh, I think we need a new law, but we also need new funding, more immigration judges or a better way to make decisions quickly on asylum cases as they come up. So, we're getting near, we'll sum up here and uh, then hear from you all. So in some tasks in front, reopening the border and trade to COVID-19. Secondly, dealing with the implementation of the USMCA trade agreement and managing these disputes, which are, are popping up, is, uh, especially US concerns in the energy area. Three, dealing with managing the border and handling migration. And really, the, the the goal is to deal with the long term, be able to deal with the long term causes of this migration, but you got to get by the short term in order to do that. Um, get back to better cooperation in dealing with drugs and illicit trafficking in both directions across the border. And then hopefully returning to that focus on looking forward, how do you make both economies and then all three economies in North America more competitive. And one of the really positive things out of AMLO's visit to Washington was agreement to restart something called the high level economic dialogue, which is basically the economic cabinets of both governments getting together and figuring out how to make the, the, the flow of economic activity smoother across the borders. And just one indication. So, if we get these borders working well, this was a study done a couple of years ago, it just shows how many jobs we could add on both sides of the border. And this was done by a Texas group, for all those of you looking at it here. But you can see we would add jobs and, and GDP on both sides of the border. Similarly, all three of the countries of North America have to face the, the challenges of new skills needed by workers. We could actually learn from each other if we were working together in this in this bigger forward-looking uh, sense of the world, we, we, would, we could see things a lot differently. And then finally, just the way people look at each other. So this is uh, Mexican uh, opinions of first of presidents. So you could see here, Mexicans did have strong opinions of uh, President Trump. And you can see the upswing uh, after he left and President uh, Biden coming in. Um, but as they look at the U.S.-Mexico relationship, they, they, they did differentiate. They already were seeing that that relationship was, was, getting, was going pretty well uh, before the change of administrations. And the same thing, Mexican opinion of the United States has actually been pretty steady, around 60 percent favorable for a number of years. And then if you look at the view, this is both together, the, the blue line being uh, uh, US citizens, you can see they also have had a very positive 
view pretty consistently of, uh, of Mexico, despite all the rhetoric that was going on. So let me stop there. And now I look forward to talking with you all. Thank you, Thank you. Um, Ambassador Wayne. Um, so as I said at the beginning, the way we'll do the questions is if you type them into the um, the, the Q&A session, um, then, uh, then I will read them. And I'll try to get to as many as I can, and I may combine some. Often people ask very similar questions. So if you don't hear your exact question, it may be that I'm merging it slightly with someone else's question, so I apologize in advance. Um, as, the, as the chair, I'm going to take, I'm going to start with my question, because um, I, I think the thing I found most surprising um, from your talk was I didn't realize what was happening to drug deaths in the US in 2020, in 2020. And I'm wondering, it seems like that the supply side should have been the closing of the border um, of the bo both borders should have made should have affected the supply side and reduced um, amount of drugs. I'm wondering, was it due to increased demand in the US? What, what, what is it? And why don't we hear so much about it? I, I, you know, if you went back to 2015, 2016, there were always stories about overdose deaths and they've kind of died off in the past three, four years. So why don't we know about it? And um, is it mostly a demand side thing, do you think? I do think it's mostly a demand side. And I think it did have to do with many people being cooped up and especially people with certain individual challenges and there not being enough uh, treatment programs available. I mean, that's one of the really weak parts of the United States effort is that we do not have sufficient programs for actually helping people who have uh, some of these challenges. And so I think what happened during the pandemic was that there, there was higher demand. And though it was, there is evidence that it was harder to get uh, this across the border and prices did go up it was still quite possible to ship things in. And part of the reason for that, and that's why actually seizures went up at the border of fentanyl and meth um, coming from Mexico in the United States. So, uh, you know, there was still a, a real effort to move things northward because people knew there were, was a market. And so that's why really, if you're gonna deal with this problem, you have to deal, start at both ends, right? And work toward the center. You have to deal with the demand and the supply side. And uh, we've been particularly uh, inept in dealing with the uh, demand side in the United States. We gotta get a lot better at that. Thank you. Um, so the first question I have is from um, Jonathan Schoon and he wants to know, how will the post-pandemic change the influx of migrants? Well, it really depends on what kind of systems we can put in place over the, uh, the months ahead. I mean, clearly it, what happened was that the combination of the pandemic and the enforcement activities um, in the last year of the Trump administration really tamped down the number of people that were willing to to try to leave Central America. But when the Biden when it was signaled that the Biden administration was coming in and people thought this was going to be a more humane administration, um, people said it's time to go and smugglers were encouraging them or if you want to call them smugglers or facilitators or whatever, people were saying, yeah, we can get you up there and, of course you can get in. And so there was this pent up demand and it, it just, people just started moving in very large numbers and the US wasn't ready for it and neither was Mexico ready for it. And I mean, one of the things evident in Mexico is Mexico is not really invested in its immigration services, its border services, or its services to care for refugees and, and asylum seekers. So they have very limited capacity to do that. And, and then on the US side also, uh, this had not been a focus of the Trump administration uh, to f actually accept people. And, um, and the Biden team wasn't, wasn't ready for that surge. So what I would hope is that we'll get a more um, well thought through system working both in the countries of origin, working with Mexico at the border, um, 
as this goes forward. So if there is a continued high level of, of demand, it, it can be dealt with. I know that in a previous time we looked, for example, at allowing people to come in to our embassies in the countries where they lived to make an, uh, to apply for asylum there. Um, there are a number of things that could be tried as we go forward to make this into a more manageable and reasonable system. But I would never suspect that it's going to be easy, um, for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Our, our next question is from Dennis Linares, and he wants to know what's the process for someone to get a visa to the to the United States and then to get their citizen in the in America if the person wants to enter America legally at the current time. Well, if you're in another country, you go to the U.S. Embassy or to the consulate. There's a consulate in Nuevo Laredo you could go to and ask for a, a visa to come to the United States. I think the citizen visas are all issued out at Ciudad Juarez, I believe. So you'd have to go there and apply. And I, I think all the criteria for getting citizenship are available online. Um, just by typing it in and, and looking up all that you need to do. Thank you. Um, the, the next question is, um, do you think expansionary monetary policy would benefit Mexico? Yes, <laughs> I do. I think AMLO's approach of austerity, uh, as you know, was a fairly minority view in the world um, uh, as how to deal with this. And in fact, what essentially what has happened is the United States has been serving as Mexico's expansionary source of growth and it will probably do so over the year ahead mexico is going to get a lot of benefit out of the expansion from the new uh, from the recently passed spending law in in the united states and that will show up in in remittances being sent home by people and it will show up in uh, purchases of products that people will make and and mexico will benefit from that because a number of those products will be made and put together in Mexico. Sorry, I was just looking at the questions again. From this is from Humberto Vea. He says, um, "What can one? What can the U.S. government and the Mexican government do to reduce government corruption in Mexico?" Well. <laughs> I mean, I think I don't know that the U.S. government can can uh, can do a lot except to support uh, the Mexican government if they seriously uh, are serious about different uh, approaches to doing this. We can provide training to Mexican prosecutors and investigators in in methods that we've found valuable for tracking down corruption, and we have done that over the years and. Uh, the, for example, the Financial Intelligence Unit uh, has been in Mexico, has been trained over the years by the United States, and and actually there's a cooperative relationship where uh, information is exchanged. Uh, we have also uh, had exchanges between federal prosecutors in both countries in in cases where corruption has shown up. Um, that system is right now a bit under strain because of the new law that, that Mexico passed, but it, it is a way that could go forward. Um, but I ba basically, I think that Mexico has to decide it really wants to deal with the level of impunity in the country and not just publicly denounce people for corruption or arrest them and then hold them, they actually need to bring them to trial and convict them. And it's not an easy thing to do, I know, but it appears to have been particularly challenging uh, through uh, all the Mexican administrations that I remember studying. So I, I think there's just a qualitative leap forward that's needed in the Mexican justice system. Thank you. The next question is for Jose Pena, and um, I think that this may be a question that you, that you may have to say whether you agree with his premise or not. He says, it's well known that cartels smuggle illegals into the U.S. Do you believe the Biden administration has been ineffective at handling 
the large influx of Ill illegal immigrants, thus enabling the cartels. And he says this is given the fact that they signal that illegals are welcome. So I guess it's just a both. Do you agree with the premise? And 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 how would you answer it? I guess I would answer that cartels seek to profit and benefit from migrants coming into the United States. That is, they charge tolls if you come to the other side of that river right near you guys. That territory is usually controlled by some criminal group. And when somebody, when some migrants come up, you have to pay a little toll if you want to come across. And that sometimes they will also utilize that by sending a group of migrants across in one place and then 500 meters away from that, they might send some of their drugs across. So when the Border Patrol or the or others are going to collect the migrants, they ship some other stuff across. Um, so I think it's a little bit different than was portrayed in the question. But the cartels certainly play a key part in this. And the fact that they have effective control over some of that of that important territory on the other side there uh, does allow them to do that. So one of the a big step forward would be not to allow them to have effective control in some of the stretches of that territory. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Carlo Velasquez and he wants to know um, you, in, in your talk you mentioned some of the constitutional changes. You mentioned that uh, that the, the new Mexican president wants to um, make some constitutional changes. He says, um, what are they and how will this impact the U.S.-Mexico relationship? Well, I, I think they are. He wants to give the uh, Federal Electricity Authority and the um, the National Oil Company, Pemex, uh, con a controlling interest over the oil and electricity sectors. And what that will mean effectively is um, making much less valuable the billions of dollars of investment that U.S., Canadian, and European companies have put into Mexico since 2013. So this will lead to a number of disputes if it goes forward, um, probably under the USMCA agreement, under the US, the EU-Mexico agreement, and under the uh, CPTPP, what used to be the Trans-Pacific Partnership, but then got renamed the Comprehensive and something Trans-Pacific Partnership. I don't remember what the other, the second letter stands for at the moment. But basically, um, those all those agreements say you're not supposed to benefit a publicly owned a, a publicly owned company over private investment and these that's what these laws would do because they are reversing the previous reform that actually opened the energy sector up to private sector investment and so the the effect of this these uh, signals is not is in primarily in the energy sector, but it's not just in the energy sector, because other potential new investors look at Mexico and they're worried. They say, "Gee, well, is this government going to do that? If I make an investment, might they do it in my area?" Now, that might not be the intention of the government, but if you're going to invest several billion dollars, you you wonder about that. And as you remember, there was a large uh, refinery, uh, not refinery, a large um, beer manufacturing facility that was going to be built up near Mexicali that was stopped after the company had spent somewhere up where toward a billion dollars. And um, there, you know, there's some other signals that it just have people worried. So. Yeah. At a moment when Mexico could be attracting a tremendous amount of investment because of the USMCA agreement and the interest in the United States of having near shoring of investment so they don't have long extended unreliable supply chains, there are doubts being sowed. Thank you. I, I will say that um, you actually anticipated one of the late, later questions. It was about how how would um, call to nationalize parts of the energy sector play under USMCA. So I won't ask that question now. 
Um, the next question is, um, what's your opinion on the impact on the relationship between the United States and Mexico based upon the current Mexican regime putting more emphasis on its relationship with China and Russia in terms of political and business relations? I mean, I don't think there's a big impact right now in that. It's always potentially, of course, there could be if there were some major strategic uh, relationship established. Um, but clearly, the government in, in Mexico is is looking to have uh, relationships with both of those governments. So we've seen it in the in the vaccine diplomacy that's been going on. Uh, but what's really surprising is that you know the chi China has not uh, greatly enhanced its efforts to invest in Mexico um, over recent years. I mean, there, you know, there's relationships. And part of that, I think, is because that Mexico actually buys a lot from China already. Uh, and as I, 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 I'm sure, I'm pretty sure it's still true that uh, Mexico has a very large trade deficit with China. And in part because they get a lot of the inputs that they use in building things in Mexico from China. The next question is, um, is from Larry Norton, and he, he says that one of the biggest problems affecting trade at the moment is um, the U.S.'s failure to properly fund infrastructure on, on the border, especially facilities and personnel at bridges. Um, do you think that um, the, the, the do, do you think with the change in administration that, that this will change, um, especially, I guess, if the infrastructure bill passes? Well, I would hope it, it would change. It was a big problem when I was ambassador. We had to spend a lot of time trying to get people to focus on a coordinated plan on both sides of the border, actually, to uh, build infrastructure. As you know, there's a very famous bridge that was a bridge to nowhere up j just south of uh, Ciudad Juarez in El Paso. The United States built half the bridge. and. The Mexicans have subsequently built the bridge, but they didn't build it for several years after the U.S. half was built. And similarly, in uh, out west um, near uh, San Diego and Tijuana, the Mexicans actually built a new crossing and the United States hadn't invested in it. So the new crossing was ready on the Mexican side, but not on the U.S. side. This is a big area for improvement, both coordination between the two governments and coordination within each government to get the funding and the planning right for these cross-border infrastructure uh, programs. So I would hope that uh, that money from the, the new uh, bill would go into supporting that kind of infrastructure, but it would need to be matched by Mexican willingness to invest in infrastructure on the Mexican side also. Um, you know, and, and so I don't know about that. The next question is from Carlo Velasquez, and he wants to know, why do you believe corruption rates have gone up during AMLO's time as president? I don't know why corruption rates have gone up. I only know what Inige said that they found. Inige said they found. Um, I, I, I really do not understand why corruption rates would have gone up. And I don't think my, well, let me say what I, what I think here is that I don't think big corruption has gone up, you know, big scale corruption at the very top. I don't think that's the case. But I do think that you have a system where corruption has become regularized um, at a number of different levels, including the street level. And you're not going to solve that just by saying we're, we're, you know, we're not going to be corrupt anymore. You actually have to institute systems that ends you impunity and actually holds people to account if they're corrupt, even in small ways. And, you know, I, I don't know. I might be wrong. I'm a big systems guy, right? If you got laws and you have courts that actually function and people get arrested and they actually go to court and they get fined or they they get consequences, you start changing people's behavior. And so if you have a system that really is bollocked up, it's hard to have a, establish a new pattern of behavior. 
The next question is from Carlos Ayala, and he says that um, he talks about Guatemala and Honduras, and he wants to know when will we see a plan to invest and fix the root cause of their problems, um, narcotics and corruption? And I, I guess my related question to this would be, and what can the U.S. do to help in this situation? Yeah, that's a real easy question to answer. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, Biden has promised a billion dollars a year in assistance. Now, you know, one thing we should have learned and we could be reminded of now as we're pulling out of Afghanistan is you just can't throw money at a problem. And the same thing in Central America. It doesn't help if we say we're going to spend all this money in assistance if you don't have a good plan for how you use that assistance and you don't have good local partners who are actually committed to using the assistance well to create jobs to stop government malfeasance and to give people alternatives you know for example the people from the highlands of guatemala where apparently climate change is making a number of their farms uh not profitable or not work anymore so it's not going to be easy um, in the best of situations, it's going to take five to 10 years of consistent investment, which is something the United States has not been good at. If you look at our aid programs for Central America, it, it, they go up and down and up and down. We have not been consistent. And you're going to have to have um, partners with the political will to bring change in those countries. And that's one of the big challenges. And it really brings up this issue of OK, how much should you be pressing other countries to get better at governing themselves? And does this raise that whole nationalist, you know, you're stop pushing me around? Well, if you want all of our, our money and, and, you know, that's going to help your people, you have to do some things that shows you're serious about using it. And that's, that's a back and forth and it's not easy. So we got to figure that, that out. So I hope we can deal with it. We have now a president who learned about the problem in 2013, 2014, 2015. He knows it's a tough problem. He's willing to invest in it. Let's see if the partners down there are going to be good partners. The next two questions I'm going to combine there from Monica um, Guiza and Alma Azate, and um, they ask, how much can ALMA affect the Mexican economy? And related to this, how will it affect the U United States if, in the worst case scenario, Mexico becomes socialist? Well, I don't think Mexico will become socialist because I don't think the Mexicans are socialists. I think that there are many small entrepreneurs in Mexico. And uh, I, so I, I, I so, but let, let's just assume that's your question. Um, I think Mexico could become much more social, social democratic, as one might say, if we were talking about Europe, that's possible. And, you know, I think that that could be OK if what you mean by socialism is doing away with democratic practices and liberties, then I think we would have problems between the two countries. Um, you know, you already have it if you not that Canada is socialist, but in Canada, you already have a government and different provinces that actually have a lot of very different social programs than you have in the United States. Um, and it's not a it's not a challenge between the good relationship. Or to the good relationship. Sorry. On, on the other end of um, of this, um, Paul Frey asked, do you think there's any possibility of um, welcoming foreign investment in the energy sector in Mexico while um, AMLO is president. I think it, there's always some possibility. I would I would not give it a high percentage. I think his worldview. Well, I think his worldview is he would like to see the predominant position of control being with the nationalized entities. Within that, there is a chance of having partnerships with the private sector. Um, to handle certain tasks and to do certain things. I think that's quite possible. Um, but I think he's a firm believer from uh, the opinions he established as he was going through life 
that there should be that this is an issue of national sovereignty and there should be a lead role there and that that is with it that there is partnership with the private sector possible within that framework thank you um thank you. I, I guess they sh Ama Azata just uh just uh, clarify the question she's saying talking about socialism like in Venezuela or in C Cuba was the kind of socialism okay. she was thinking well, I think about. that would be a problem because it would be doing away with democracy I think the democracy is a problem is a problem and if you don't have democracy yes that would be a problem between the two countries um the uh, one question that's come up a couple of times is, um, and I can partly answer this, is um, people have enjoyed your presentation a lot, and a couple of people have asked whether the visuals can be made available to participants. And I can, one thing I will say is that um, one thing we do do for these all these talks um, that we give is we record them, and then we caption them, and then we put them on YouTube. Um, so for people who are here and you want to re relive the experience, it will be available on YouTube. It takes about two weeks for 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 us to do that because um, because of getting the, the the closed captioning done professionally. Okay. Um, so you, knew, you I think you knew that. Um, the next question is. Um, Are there any particular firms or industries that you see as solid opportunities for private individuals investing in Mexico? <laughs> <laughs> David Lamb. I, I'm sure they are, but I don't think I'll give my investment uh, recommendations here. I mean, there are a number <laughs> of growth sectors. And uh, well, I will step back and say, it, it seems to me there's a tremendous set of opportunities that Mexico has because of its linkage to North America's supply chains. And that touches in a whole bunch of areas, you know, the biggest one being vehicles and all the things that go into vehicles, but, you know, many other things, many appliances and uh, flat screen TVs and all sorts of other things get made across the border and it also even go, it goes into the agricultural area as some of you may remember uh, at the beginning of nafta mexico had a large deficit with the united states in the agricultural area uh, my recollection is that they've had a surplus with the united states for a number of years now because um, the mexican agricultural sector adapted and started producing a lot of things that people really like in the United States and are consumed on a regular basis. So there's a lot of possibilities here. And I think under the USMCA, uh, th there's a new emphasis on trying to get small and medium enterprises to be involved in this. There's a, a special new chapter in that and a special committee that's going to be set up. There are, uh, there's a new emphasis on digital services and everything that can be done on the internet and trying to make that possible. So I think that opens up possibilities in both directions for innovation and investment in as this as these economies become more and more modern and go forward. So, you know, yeah, I think there's a, there's a lot of possibility there. But I won't give out my uh, stock suggestions. Um, the, the, the next question is, um, what are some of the ways in which USMCA addresses labor rights and the environment that, that were overlooked in NAFTA? Well, the first thing is for the, the, both of those chapters are now in the treaty before they were separate agreements outside. And the labor chapter specifically includes explicit mention of a number of the international agreements and uh, bilateral agreements where there are commitments to democracy in the labor area. Um, and there is also a rapid dispute settlement process uh, specifically for labor, where if there are complaints that, that labor democracy is not being respected, including individual plants, there has to be a rapid investigation and there can be a rapid imposition of sanctions on a particular plant that is not respecting those rights. So now we'll have to see how this works, but it's brand new. It has not been used before. 
it, it is built with a recognition that Mexico is introducing these labor reforms, which are going to be implemented over four years. Um, so that's built into this process. Um, but a number of US unions have said that they're going to be looking for cases to, to test this. And so we should probably expect something over the next year that will pop up uh, with a, a case and we'll see, we'll see how well this mechanism works. One question that we have is obviously one of the things that President Trump complained a lot about was how how um, low tariffs and easy imports from Mexico were hurting American jobs. So KV Sanchez wants to know um, how do you think it would affect the U.S. economy if we did raise tariffs on 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 Mexico? Well. I mean, I, I think that's quite unlikely under this current regime and the new treaty. This, this isn't the Trump regime. <laughs> I doubt they're going to call it national security uh, and, and apply certain things to Mexico. I think they'll use the USMCA to do that. Secondly, um, you know, the Trump policy was just wrong. Mexico is actually, the trade with Mexico has actually created many more jobs in the United States than it's destroyed. The problem was that the jobs that were lost ended up with people not being able to find new jobs because the new jobs created in the U.S.-Mexico relationship were in different places often and often had higher skill requirements. So if you've been working in a tire factory and the tire factory moved to Mexico, you didn't get a new tire job. There were jobs created in Arizona or Texas doing something else that that had to do with supporting the service trade or supporting that trade in a different way, for example, or as part of the aviation supply chain. That's a different kind of job. And we did not have pro programs in the United States, which you know, you know about, that actually upskilled workers on a regular basis, and especially that were targeted to those cities that were losing plants and investment. So one of the, I think, really good things in the proposals from the new U.S. administration is to actually spend a lot of money in effective skill building programs that can allow people to be reskilled and upskilled if there is disruption. And the important thing, I think, to remember is that there's going to be a lot of disruption. Technology is going to keep disrupting jobs on a regular basis. And we're going to, all of us, have to learn new skills on a regular basis. And so why not build systems in our own countries that help you do that? That's, that would be smart. Thank you. The next question is from Bahama Alvarez. And he wants to know, once the border state, is, once the border is reopened, um, do you think that this will in, um, generate a, um, a lot for the United States? Is I guess the first question. I, I guess my my related question is, how long will this take? I mean, the U.S. is is being fairly quick on vaccination, but I think Mexico's running a little bit more slowly. And um, what can the U.S. do to speed up this reopening of the border? Well, you know, I organized a discussion session with a number of experts. And uh, about two and a half weeks ago or so, and um, it, after the end of the discussion, it was true that it was clear that a lot of people had ideas for new apps and using new technologies to open the border, but nobody was sure when we were going to do this, how quickly we we would do it. And um, I think that one of the good things about the Canadian and U.S. borders is that trading goods is going on. You know, that hasn't stopped, really. I mean, it had disruptions, but it is going on. People crossing the border is a different thing. And I think you're exactly right, George, that it is going to depend on vaccinations. It's going to depend if we can get an agreement on the kind of credentials that will show effectively that you've had a vaccination or, you know, that, that somewhere else you can be trusted, you've been tested. You know, there's a quick test. You've shown that this works and stuff. And one of the challenges is we're already seeing, as you read in the articles and stuff, people are faking these already, right? And they're all over 
international travelers are arriving all the time with now fake identifications and the airlines are stuck at the moment trying to figure this out. Um, but I think what we're going to have to do is have systems at both borders that there's agreement in, between you know Canada, the United States and the US and Mexico as to how you're gonna judge people when they're coming in. And as far as I know, we haven't had those discussions yet. So I'm sorry to all of you living there in Laredo and waving over to Nuevo Laredo and vice versa. I hope there'll be ways that this can be, be eased effectively, but I don't see right now a rush to do that. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question, and I apologize to everybody in the questions who who um, who I haven't got to your question. Um, we did get a lot of questions, and I and I and I apologize, and I also apologize to those people who I butchered your question so much it, never, it didn't ask what you wanted in the end. So the final question is from Carlos Ayala, and he wants says, the labor commitment set in the trade agreement are tougher for Mexican companies than for U.S. companies, basically obliging Mexican companies to have unions. Um, is this a fair balance? It's what was negotiated in the treaty, Carlos. And if you could fo if you could forge that question as effectively as you did, you know, you know that's what was negotiated. Um, and uh, I I would say that it's uh, it's not perfectly balanced to stay in it diplomatically, but on the other hand, respect for labor rights in Mexico has been abysmal in many cases, and so they had a negotiation and this is where they came out. I mean, the real solution is to have. Uh, better respect for labor rights and labor democracy in in both countries. Um, and, you know, we just saw this big case of the vote at the Amazon facility in the United States about whether to be unionized or not. And the worker it was closely scrutinized by many people. And I haven't seen any accusations that the vote count was rigged. People chose not to have a union. So, you know, I don't know what we do about that, but you're right. The conditions in USMCA regarding labor are the conditions that were negotiated. And that's what we have to live with right now. Well, thank you very much. Um, I, I Before we go, I want to, firstly, I, I should um, tell you, Ambassador Wayne, that um, you, in all the comments, you, there are a lot of people who have been thanking you for your presentation. So thank you very much on, on my behalf and also on their behalf too. Um, I want to thank um, everyone who came to um, and everyone who asked questions. And I apologize if I didn't get to your question. Um, and I, of course, want to thank once more um, IBC Bank and Commerce Bank for their support of um, of this of this um, of, of this series. We wouldn't be able to do it without them. So thank you very much. And thank you, Ambassador Wayne, for a um, great presentation and a great question and answer session. Well, thank you very much for uh, inviting me. I look forward to getting to Texas A&M International uh, another time and in person. And I wish you much success in the conference that you're going to have uh, in the, the other sessions in the next uh, couple of days. And it's been a great pleasure to talk with all of you. I wish you wish you the very best. And let's hope we can all work through these issues between these two vital partners in a, in a harmonious way that makes it better for all of us. Thanks.